Okay, so we're live. Okay, uh, welcome everybody to our first case study in Foreman. Uh, our guest today is Tommy McNeely. He's uh, working at uh, Lark IT, and and what we're going to do is basically to cover uh, topics like um, what are they doing at Lark IT with Foreman. Um, just one second. Okay, sorry, I had another another window open with with four minutes, with with this uh, YouTube channel, and it was uh, making this. Okay, so we're just going to discuss what do they do with Foreman, what are their uh, problems with it, uh, how do users use it, uh, how was it for him to write a plugin, any bottlenecks, and so forth. So. Uh, Welcome, uh, Tommy. Uh, okay. Okay. So, can you tell us a bit about uh, Lark IT and yourself? How did you? What industry is it? Consulting. What What do you guys uh, do? Okay. So, uh, Lark IT is a Denver-based, uh, Denver, Colorado, USA-based organization that has been around more or less. Uh, I've worked for different iterations of it since like 1998, um, but basically we started off as a Windows IT support firm, and I came into the organization building Linux firewalls to replace really obnoxious Windows proxy servers. Um, just basically cranking them out, find some old desktop that they basically thrown into a closet and put Linux on it and make it their gateway. And they loved me for that. And then I you know, started doing antivirus and things like that on it. And, uh, progressed along and um, later I went to work at Sun and just did this stuff, stuff on the side for them. Then I went over to, well then Sun became Oracle and then I didn't work at Oracle so <laughs> that didn't work out. But uh, I ended up coming on full time with Lark IT as they were starting to gain some full Linux support clients where we were actually going out and supporting a, like a huge store environment with like 10 plus stores and things like that. And uh, you know it, it just has kind of blossomed. The Linux side has really blossomed. We have we are partnered with a uh, web development organization that does a lot of Ruby on Rails type stuff and we started by getting them off of their dedicated servers at Rackspace. They had a dedicated server that was costing them, I want to say, $700 to $1,500 a month, somewhere in that range. And we moved them all over to shared hosting. We're like, oh, yeah, you can do it all in shared hosting. So we started doing that. We ended up getting to the point where they said, hey, you know, we can't do this Ruby stuff on shared hosting. And we started building these servers for them. We started realizing that building a Ruby on Rails server is a lot of work. I mean, the document that I had used, I think, was real close to three pages. And that was very small text, <laughs> step, step, step by step by step to, to build these servers. And uh, somewhere along the lines, uh, somebody sent me some information about Puppet. And I said, hey, this Puppet stuff looks neat. We should try to do this. And we've actually, since we started doing that, we've gotten all, almost all of our other clients into Puppet. One of them has actually gone and purchased Puppet Enterprise, too. So we feel kind of good about that, supporting the, the, the actual you know company that creates this for us. But uh, we, we've gotten to the point where we've built some modules in Puppet that will take care of this RVM and setting up the like environment, the SSH keys and all that stuff for these guys to where basically I can click about five times and have a, a Rails hosting environment for these guys ready to go, which is just awesome. Which, of course, Foreman has been instrumental in because the biggest problem I had with Puppet was it didn't have a decent provisioning system. Okay, so as I, as I see it, uh, you guys are basically uh, more or less given the infrastructure for your clients and that's uh, your use case for Foreman, uh, your only use case for Foreman, right? Right, so, so basically we provide system support at Lark IT, we provide desktop support as well, but I'm not in that part of the organization. Um, I, I provide the Linux system support, and we basically come all the way up to, here's the place where you deploy your application to. Um, 
as a part of learning how to do that, I've become involved in the code quite a bit. And as you know, they venture into advanced topics like SAML single sign-on and things like that. I've I've brought in just you know general troubleshooting techniques and helped them you know get in there and uh, through through all of that, I think that you know I've learned more Ruby than I ever thought I ever would, honestly. But uh, <laughs> you know, it was mostly a helping to find out what their requirements were because being basic Ruby developers, they couldn't define what their system requirements were. And so I had to go in and find out what they needed and then recreate that. And it's it's been a, a learning process on both sides. I think that it's I, I've been pretty happy with what we've got so far. I still wouldn't release it because it's really nasty, nasty. It was, you, you know, when you you start writing a module and then you go take puppet training and you're like, ooh, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> so it's it's one of those kind of modules right now. And it right now it's it's like this gargantuan thing that does everything from stuff that should be in a profile to like two or three different modules. So um hasn't been released yet, but you know, it's it's one of those things that's coming. I just need to clean it up some. But uh man, once we found one one of our uh former employees now, he still does some ten ninety nine stuff here and there. Uh, was one of our customers' IT guys, and he got us into Spacewalk. And we started with Spacewalk. That's actually where we started with configuration management. And we had this really um, extensive setup where we had tiers of configuration, and they were numbered configuration channels, like a 100 level would be for a role-specific thing, and then... 200 level would be for generic stuff like all web servers, and 300 would be for something that was a little more, all the way down to 700, which was applied to all servers. And then we had a cron job literally on the spacewalk server that would sort the configuration channels by number, that's why they were number-based, so that they would apply correctly, stuff that would override stuff correctly. And as I've learned Puppet, I'm like, oh my god, that was so overcomplicated. And and Spacewalk's uh, macro language is a little weak in that respect. I mean, <laughs> it it wasn't very fun to use. But but you know, it got us into the idea of a centralized configuration. And then Puppet was obviously the next logical step for us. So so we started building with Puppet with our other customers, as we were building new stuff, we would just say, no, no, we're doing it in Puppet. And we have now the goal of <clears throat> zero logins to the server, no sysadmin logins. Obviously, we log in and patch the server. But, mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're, currently, uh, we're currently using Spacewalk and Foreman simultaneously, which is why I'm so interested in Catello. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to get rid of Spacewalk and just move over to Pulp, but um, I don't want to manage them all separately. So, yeah, we're looking forward to that coming up in so what what is blocking you in that? It's uh, it's because you guys are not able to uh, get Catel right now and plug it into a existing foreman, or or it's is it something else? Nope, it's basically that um, we started with foreman, we started with puppet, and then we moved mm -hmm. to foreman, and now we want Catello, and it's like oh wait, but you need to start with the Catello installer. And we're like wait, so so right now we're kind of in that that waiting pattern of. Do we just completely start over with, you know, start with the Catello installer and just start over with a brand new system, or do we, because we only have, to be perfectly honest, I think we have like 15 or 18 systems on our Foreman server, so it's not like mm -hmm. it would be that hard. Uh, so we have that choice right now. Do we just start over, or do we wait and see if we can get this Catello plug-in installer thing that's coming? We're crossing our fingers, right? Right. Uh, yeah, the... There's actually a team of like three or four people. Uh, I don't know if they're watching right now. Uh, maybe I can pick them on IRC uh, in a bit and to tell them like to come. Uh, they, they are uh, working on adding support to the Foreman installer to to install Catello itself. Uh, it it involves removing a bit of dependencies like Elasticsearch and and other things and making sure it works with MySQL as well and uh, that way, uh, it should be possible to install with the Foreman installer. Um, I'm not sure how far along they they are uh, so far. So, so is, is this a system? Uh, all of Lark IT server support is working on. 
I mean, the Fortman uh, deployment, or is it something that you only have like admin access over it, and the support people have like restricted uh, roles? Uh, how 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 does that work? So currently, the Linux team at Lark IT is two people. Uh, so, so we don't. We're both basically the admins. Um, we're talking about getting a third guy that would be in that more of a junior role, where he would be able to go in and and do the provisioning, but not do all the setup stuff, and maybe do patching and things like that. But we just don't have that yet. Uh, so to be so, like I said, we have two users, and we have one customer that logs in only because he's he's one of those technical people that knows enough to get himself in trouble. So. Uh, and people are hitting me in X chat. Oh, that's it. okay. All right. So, uh, so basically, we built up a. F we had a foreman server in our office. We had VMware for whatever. That's what the Windows guys had. So we just jumped onto that. Right. Um, we built a foreman server in there, and I, I should say that our former employee Ian, who used to work at Red Hat and deployed Spacewalks. Uh, sorry, Satellite. Um, for customers, he did that, and then he came out, and that's what he did for us. He helped us deploy satellite, the open source version Spacewalk, into all and sub several of our customers. Well, we had a Spacewalk server that we had all of our s systems linked to. We had a IPA servers that we absolutely love, by the way, um, and th and then we had a Foreman server, and we had just built one new customer on that when we realized that. First of all, Comcast sucks, <laughs> and we had we had a lot of issues with reachability of our Spacewalk, IPA, and uh, Foreman instance, and uh, so we decided to build it out in the cloud. So I was just going to show you guys. I have uh, I'll do a screen share here. Um, I have my I have I built two IPA servers out there, and I did those manually only because IPA is one of those. Uh, First, you do something on the master, then you take that file and put it on the client, then you run that on the client type of processes. It's not, it might be puppetable, but I haven't, didn't at the time have the skills to do it in Puppet. Uh, I think you might have to move a little, a little slow, slower. Uh, it, it's stuck on the DigitalOcean page right now. Okay. Well, it's on the DigitalOcean page. I haven't clicked on it. Oh, okay, okay. But what I was trying to say is basically I built two IPA servers out there that are. Uh, synchronized with replicating with our two in our office. So now we have reachability out in the outside for all of our servers that are out there. And then I also built a Foreman server out there because we had uh, we had some issues with IP IP addressing and naming and whatnot. And due to the fact that Foreman and Puppet and all that stuff is very extensively using SSL, you can't just change the names of servers. Say, oh well, from the outside it's foreman.larkit.com, and but from inside it's lark-foreman. Dot, 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 whatever. Dot IPA. So we just built one out here in DigitalOcean, and DigitalOcean. We just honestly were looking for a cheaper host. We were using Rackspace before, and it was costing us like thirty or forty dollars a month for a real basic server. Um, and I don't know if you guys have ever anybody on the call has heard of DigitalOcean, but um, yeah, they are really inexpensive. Uh, they're they're on par with another one that we use called Linode. But basically mm -hmm. for for our IPA servers it's ten dollars a month. <clears throat> That's pretty inexpensive. Um, I yes. went ahead and made the Foreman server a two gig server because it's running several Ruby applications and I mean we're running Puppet. It's all in one, all the databases, all the so what, what are these specs again? It's two gigs of uh, memory and what else? Two CPUs, 40 gigs of disk, SSD, three terabytes of transfer, which doesn't really matter, for 20 okay. bucks. So, so that's basically what we're running for our Foreman server right here. And it's, uh, it's running in New York. I'm kind of indifferent about the location. I did set up my IPA servers, one in San Francisco, one in New York, just to be different. Uh, but for twenty dollars a month, that's pretty inexpensive, and it runs the Foreman server quite well. Um, our I'll be logged out, of course. Okay. <clears throat> we I... have it set up bind to IPA, and uh -huh. so the way that we do our Foreman is that 
actually, as part of building, so as part of this whole process, I decided I wanted to build DigitalOcean VMs from Foreman. And mm -hmm. I said, hey, you know, you can build Rackspace, you can build EC2, and several others. And uh, they're all using Fog, which is a Ruby gem, for those aren't, who aren't aware. And uh, Fog also supports DigitalOcean. So I said, hey, I, all I got to do is change the name of the provider, and I could just, I, so I literally took and copied stuff for, I took, I copied the Rackspace one, and I copied some ideas out of the EC2 one, and basically made a DigitalOcean, uh, I, I made it as a, I, like, core product, because I didn't know about modules at the time, <laughs> and, uh, mm -hmm. Daniel? Yeah, I, I, ideally, at, at that time, uh, I mean, uh, DigitalOcean and Fog, or a, any provider, uh, should be able to. You should be able to start it to start mm -hmm. servers and add images and everything in the same way. I think that's that was the value proposition of Fog that you you had like a common API for all the providers. It eventually morphed into something different, but but yeah, it's still very similar, uh, even for um, very different providers. Did, did you find any limitations on Fog or? Or did you have to contribute to Fog itself, or everything was was there prepared? I believe so. So I had some things that I put into the. Uh, uh, there, there's an override mechanism. I forget what it's called now, but uh, I had some things that I had put into there that that I believe uh, you or someone else, maybe it was Dominic, put it into Fog itself because it was stuff that was literally broken in Fog, and. Uh, there were some other things where things work really great in testing on, like, a Rails S instance, but it didn't work at all in production because Postgres is a little bit more specific about types than SQLite is. So there were some things that I had to work around there, uh, types being integers versus strings. Um, <clears throat> had some things to work around, but realistically, I changed the name of the provider and I changed the... You know, I, I changed the prompts a little bit because they were prompting for things that didn't make sense. With with Rackspace in in general, they, they ask you for a URL. You don't need that with DigitalOcean. There's only one. And with uh, EC2, there's a region. And I kind of copied that, and then I changed it because in DigitalOcean, you select the region at creation time. You don't. It's not. You don't have a compute resource per region. You have a compute resource that points to DigitalOcean and then you select the region when you create the VM. So I made the, the region be a, draw, a default instead of... So there were some real basic changes, but for the most part, it was... Being, I, I am completely not a Ruby developer. Absolutely not a Ruby developer. I'm not an anything developer. But I was able to pick up a... It, it works. <laughs> it works. It works. It's released, and, and it works in both 1.7 and 1.8 now. So... Um, I was able to pick up enough stuff just from doing like the Rails for Zombies thing on uh, Code School, and then going through and reading the code. I mean, Ruby reads really easily, so I, I was pretty impressed. I mean, for a non-developer to be able to come in and create a usable module is pretty awesome. I think. Um, no, I mean, I'm a, I'm definitely a technical guy, but come on. So, what we do as as part of the testing, I found out about these organizations, which drastically simplify the org. You know, being able to sort these things out because this gets a little messy. Um, but the way that we do it is we use our 10K. We have a uh, puppet environments repo, and each customer has their own puppet environment. So Summit Co. Production is just leftover stuff that I haven't fixed yet. Larson so Pen, I'm Hell, public library, right? So how how the modules get though to the to the proxy with the public master? Do you, do you allow your clients to have access there, or you have some kind of setup uh, so, for that? So the Foreman server is the puppet server. As I said, it's all in one. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of helps, uh, but we use R10K. Um, so when I uh, when I create a new customer, so the re most recent one was Prime Healthcare, I use R10K deploy customer name dash VP. First, I went into GitHub and cloned it, and of course made it customer specific. Put there. Can you increase the font the font of that? Let, let me shrink the window down a little bit first. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. So basically, that would be the command I would use when I create the customer prime healthcare. Okay. So um, let me actually just let me. I don't think that there's any private data in there, even though it's not a public repository. Um, so basically, each if if people aren't familiar with RTNK, each puppet environment is a branch in GitHub. So I create uh, Prime Healthcare, which there we go, and <clears throat> it has manifest site.pp, which literally says if there's a role, include it, otherwise complain, right? It doesn't complain catastrophically, it just complains. And the reason I do that is because then I don't have to mess with classes. Um, I'm using roles and profiles as well. Uh, if I go back up here, I can see my hire data's in here. It's fairly simple right now. I have a customer.yaml which applies to all of their machines. Stuff like allow access to SynGrid. <laughs> oh, so, so, so as I see it, you yourself, yourself you're writing the, the puppet modules for your clients, right? They don't have absolutely anything to do with... The customers that we have are not... Uh, not technical at all. Okay. No, they're so we have our customer, the customer that we bill, if you will, is the web developer. The web developer has the actual customer, which is Prime Healthcare in this case. So uh, they would have, you know, hey, what what kind of SSH config do we use? What kind of uh, this is kind of a weak place right here, but what packages do we need for our Rails? And it's just stuff that's like V8, libxslt, and libxml2, which comes on to our spacewalk servers by default, but when I stopped using spacewalk recently, um, <laughs> I had to found out that I had to add that package in. Um, and then, again, not very, maybe, uh, we'll call it dry, uh, but I do have a, a little thing that says create these database roles, um, which literally just uses the create resources against the Puppet Labs PostgreSQL module. Um, this one, the reason these are commented out is because this one's in RDS, and uh, I don't have a database server to apply these to. <laughs> so, so I just have them in there for documentation, literally. Um, and that's that's the development password. So if you screenshotted that, it's not going to do anything. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, careful, actually, because I mean, no, it's no private data. There's no private data in any of this stuff. So, okay. so here is that that R10K command goes out Etsy Puppet Environments uh, Prime Healthcare, and there's a puppet file that has, this is a PHP client actually, um, so it goes through and says here's the different modules of the different versions, this looks just like a gem file for Ruby developers. Um, these pull down from the uh, Puppet Forge, and then <laughs> the ones that are either not released recently or uh, <laughs> or our inter internal ones, which we don't pu publish, we have, uh, this This is our roles and profiles module. All it has is like uh, the configuration of what modules we're going to use. Um, and then Spacewalk, of course, we have our own Spacewalk module that basically ties together RHN registers and all those other things. So that, that's basically, it, it goes through this, this creates all the modules, right, in, in modules. Okay. okay. Uh, I don't know if you saw it on the RC channel, someone saying that, uh, someone, well, sorry, Stephen sorry, sorry. Benjamin was, la was laughing that drastically simplified and organizations were used in the same sentence. Uh, yeah, pretty much all developers have a pretty negative perception of organizations, uh, organizations and locations because they kind of uh, pollute the code oh, base. Absolutely. And, so, uh, so can you tell us maybe how, how you use them so that they're so valuable for you? Right. Uh, so as an example, um, organizations allows me to have a customer login so they can log in, they can see their organization servers, public library association in this case, um, and so they can, I, I have one customer that does it, and potentially, I'm trying to get these Ruby developers in here, but um, the, the basic concept is that each of the customers are put into their own organization, and then they have a login where they can create uh, hosts within their organization. Um, and, and then, you know, they don't, have, they don't see all the pollution of all the other hosts that are in here. 
Um, so we have a unique environment here in that we're not we don't have one customer in one ginormous data center. We have 14 customers across. You know, uh, I don't know. Let's just let's just check real quick. I think I'm up to 14 compute. Re nope. Oh, that's just for just for this customer. So we have they can deploy customers to this DigitalOcean account. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's what I was gonna ask. That, that's what I was gonna ask if, if you were charging customers uh, after they create hosts in your DigitalOcean account, account for it, where they had like their own compute resources for for each customer. Uh, mm -hmm. how, how, Oh, no, compute resource for each customer. This customer was the first one that we did with IAM, and there was some confusion and delay on getting it created. But the developers needed machines right away, so I had created. I had tried to create. I created their VMs in Commerce Kitchen's Digital Ocean account. Commerce Kitchen is the company that does the development, and then once I got this working, then I I switched over. But the idea is that I can I can set that up to where they can deploy VMs there, and then I can see them. But if I if I of course switch this back to all organ, there it is. Any organization, not all organizations. Um, you can see that I have quite a few. One for each customer: TransWest, Summico, Public Library, blah blah blah. Um, each one has their own, except for several of them use Commerce Kitchen directly. Commerce Kitchen then bills the customer for that resource directly. That's their situation. But uh, that's kind of how we're working it right now is we do a lot of the development in DigitalOcean and then we make the customer create their own account <clears throat> for production and that's where we get like the, the Rackspace, Dallas-Fort Worth and, and Ord and, and then we also have uh, several EC2 instances now um, now that we've figured out how to do that. But okay. uh, for, the, for the most part we use organizations. I used to have locations in there but you're absolutely right. Locations was just a complication that I didn't need. Um, mm -hmm. The original intention of locations was to have an internal and an external location where I could say if it was internal, then leave the SSH port alone. If it's external, set it to something obnoxious. But <clears throat> I didn't end up using that, and so I just canceled the locations out of my production instance. Um, okay. and every, everything is using the default location. But I, yeah. I did like organizations. Okay, actually, actually, organizations were pretty much uh, something that we had to do for uh, so that Catello would pick up an organization and use uh, subscriptions to that organization in 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 Candlepin and another pro another project that takes care of the area subscriptions of the that's of the, the host system. Yeah, uh, that's that's the OSAD or the. <laughs> But yeah, so what I was gonna say is that locations were actually supposed to be the convenience, while organizations uh, were pretty much had to be done. But yeah, have, having both, uh, I guess it's like too many levels. Uh, uh, that it, it can get complicated. Uh, th there is a question like I'm seeing on the Q and A. Uh, oh, two actually. Uh, one is not really a question. Is Stephen Benjamin is mentioning? He is working on the Catello and Foreman as a as a plugin that you can actually put without reinstalling Foreman. Uh, he's working on it, and he says that on 1.9 or 1.10, it should be there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a ticket a tracker. Uh, I'm going to put it on the showcase app. So here in the Hangout, people should be able to get a link to the tracker. Uh, if it's edited, it should show it should show up as in the YouTube video and also for anyone watching it right now. Um, uh, there was another question uh, by Stephen Benjamin as well. Yep. He was asking if you are using you, you were mentioning IPA before, are you using Realm integration informant? Absolutely. I, I absolutely love the fact that I could just say, yes, I'm using IPA, and it went through and set up the all of the uh, stuff in IPA DNS. It went through and set up the uh, uh, proxy to do its stuff, and it just it worked. I, I could log in. After doing the, the Foreman installer, I was able to log in with my IPA account. I thought that was completely awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> the only thing that I had a problem with, and that was my problem, is that uh, I had some CentOS... Seven, the three and four are seven, and mm -hmm. one and two are still six point five. 
six point six. Uh, and apparently IPA is not directly compatible between the two versions. So I had to do some trickery to get uh, to make the Foreman server only able to talk to three and four. Um, because it's seven as well, and so that that was the only problem I had, and that's not Foreman's problem, that's IPA's problem. So <laughs> um, they there some backwards compatibility issues there between six and seven, or between whatever their versions are. I don't know what they are exactly, but three and four or whatever. But that really, I mean, once I figured that out, it was perfect. Um, I did have some issues in the beginning with it losing track of its. Uh, the Foreman proxy would lose its authorization somehow, and, and I would have to regenerate the keys, but I think that was actually a bug that was uh, fixed already, because I haven't had that problem since I went to, like, even 172. So that was I was on 1.6 when I had that problem. But I absolutely, like I said, the, the Realm integration is great. I'm using, uh, I don't think that's where I wanted to go. It said, I have LDAP authentication turned on, but it's not being used. It's not configured. Um, See, it's not set up at all. The uh, okay, so you have IPA only for uh, registering your hosts, but not for um, logging in as a sorry. No, you, use your accounts are not an IPA. Like the account that you're using right now, it's just a regular uh, Foreman account, not no, connected. To the, only, the only internal Foreman account is admin, and I don't use that account. As a matter of fact. Let me rephrase that. <laughs> I never use the admin account except for when I set up the Ypsilon. Other than that, I logged in as admin one time to set up my account, and that was it. Ever, ever since then, I only use my own account, in, uh, and it's, it says authorized by external, which is using the IPA server. Um, it's not, I, I, I went to the LDAP just to prove I wasn't using LDAP. Um, oh, okay, it, okay. <laughs> it actually uses PAM authentication, I believe, yes. when, it, when it authenticates. Uh, but it, it works really, really well, and I'm also able to even create groups in uh, in IPA that apply in here. So I can say, uh, you know, here my admins group is Lark IT DevOps admin, and it pulls oh. that group in. So that's are you using that feature? Because because I see four users. Are you I'm using sorry, use this one? I apologize. It was okay. this. One. <laughs> Foreman admins because the so so the user Brian B Gwynn Brian Gwynn did not exist in here his name wasn't checked in here until he logged in and created his account it, it sort of creates their account in Foreman once they log in with IPA and then he showed up in here and he was automatically in here because he was a member of this external group right here Foreman admins okay okay that, that that's actually yeah. Uh, use, the intended use case. It, 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 how, how large is your LDAP installation, though? Because we, we've seen uh, that it works pretty well for some people, uh, but we've also seen people on the RC channel saying that that it it started to take like 50 seconds to log in or things like that because it was doing all the checks to see if the user was in the in the IPA or in the LDAP uh, group or not. Did, did you did you notice any change in that like login time or or uh, yeah pretty much that or moving around the interface now that you're using uh, user groups linked to that? I so so to be honest, I never ever used it directly with local accounts. Um, I had the only time I've ever done that is in the development server, which is really slow anyway because it's a VM. Uh, Vagrant VM. Uh, the only thing I've ever used is this, and it works fine for me. I've not had any problems, but I just logged in and checked. We have 31 users in our uh, IPA, so we don't have a, a very sizable uh, IPA deployment. Um, and we also, I, I would also point out that it's a network local deployment, so there is an IPA server on the same subnet, if you will, with this Foreman server. Okay. Uh just one thing. There's a question by Ivan Netas on on the Q and A. He is wondering how soon after the release are you updating to the latest format, and if if there is any validation procedure before you you move to production. So one it was released yesterday. Uh, did you wait or <laughs> what? 
I had to wait because we use the DigitalOcean module extensively. Oh. And, and the developer for the DigitalOcean module, that's me, uh, forgot to do the packaging stuff. <laughs> so, so I did the packaging stuff last night, and we'll see if it's, if it's out there. I can go ahead and bump it up to one. It, it was merged this morning, I think. So, okay. so I will... Uh, I will go ahead and uh, do it on my development server first. I have a Vagrant VM that I do this development in, and I'll verify that it works there. And then uh, if, as long as everything looks generically okay and I don't do a real extensive testing, I go in here to DigitalOcean and uh, shut it down, and then I go into DigitalOcean and snapshot the VM just in case things go really horribly wrong. Uh, sure, there's a, RP, a yum downgrade, but eh, not when there's database changes, right? Um, so I snapshot the VM in here, and then I do the upgrade. And so far, I haven't ever had to roll it back, but I, that's just me being extremely careful. Uh, <laughs> so I have, I also have backups constantly, but there was a snapshot that I took before I went to 1.7 right there, or 1.7.4 maybe, because that's 19. Yeah. Sorry, you're using snapshots provided by DigitalOcean, or you you yourself uh, get a backup of the database system case? I just take a snapshot of the VM in DigitalOcean. Um, okay. I, I do assume that there would be a, I could do a database backup and do yum downgrades and all that stuff, and that's a fine option if you're using bare metal. But right. when you have VMs, I say shut it down and take a snapshot. Then if you need to roll it back, all you got to do is it's basically just boot it back up where it was before. It makes it really, really easy, and almost everybody provides that snapshot capability now. So, and did um, you ever have to do it? <laughs> right. And so, so I'm on one seven four. I I tried a yum upgrade yesterday, and it didn't go up in my package list. Actually, I made a yum check upgrade, but mm -hmm. um, I was looking at the calendar. Apparently, okay. Never mind. I can't look at that. Um, mm -hmm. So I assume that I actually have to subscribe to a different repository. I don't know what Ableton identity is. That one of this guy's not using Spacewalk, so it makes it a little easier. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but for the most part, I'm trying to stay up to date because... Oh, there you go. All kinds of fun stuff in there today. <laughs> That's probably going to break me, but... Uh, just, it's still just, loading here. I haven't seen it. I, I'm not... I'm not going to do it live on the call because I do want to <laughs> test it on my... I do want to test it on my dev box, but uh, there are 1.8 right. going up in here now, so... That means to me that it's time to go. Um, I, I, I'm totally okay with trying to stay up to date. Um, I have one instance in my uh, that I that I have in our office is still on one six because it had some horrible problem when I tried to update it, and it's it's a local problem caused by a spacewalk <laughs> because it's. It was having problems synchronizing or something. I don't know the whole story, but I, I think it was the uh, SCL that it wasn't synchronizing right or something. But I, I had to deal with that on my own. But that's why my, my production form of story just goes direct. Um, but yeah, my, my goal eventually is to get Pulp, the, or sorry, Catello, which is Pulp and Hamilton, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, the only problem that I may have with uh, DigitalOcean at that point is that they do not have the ability to add storage. So... I'll probably end up spinning that up in Amazon. Okay. Is, is it... Yeah, it's not something that we can do... Uh, like, if, if you're using the a computer research uh, for... Is, are you managing your Foreman with, with Foreman or, or not? Uh, uh, so it's in there. If I go to host, the Foreman server is in here, but... I actually went through this exercise a while back and I never finished it, mm -hmm. but the Foreman installer is Puppet, and right. I wanted to just generate the Puppet manifest that it uses and put them in and say, here's my com Puppet configuration for Foreman to make sure it stays right. Um, and then also I could add stuff like PuppetDB, and, which I'm still woefully behind on, and R10K, there's a Puppet module for that as well, which I just... Puppet applied it directly, which was naughty, but I did it anyway. Um, <laughs> but but the key here is that it, it is in here, but it's not doing anything. If I... Uh, here we go. Like, I know it's in here. <laughs> so okay. I have a key foreman uh, host group. By the way, I use host groups extensively, too. No, don't ever take that, mm -hmm. take that away from me. Um, but it doesn't do any 
anything. It, it runs Puppet every 30 minutes, but I think all it's doing right now, as a matter of fact, there's not even any applies. There's zero. It's doing nothing. Got it. So, so it's basically, you have it there uh, just in case you want to, well, perhaps. Well, my plan was to manage the firewall with it at a minimum. Oh, okay. uh, because I, while my Puppet server is out on the internet, it's not open to the whole world. I have it uh, limited resource. Uh, I, what I do is I go through and say, okay, um, I'm going to create a VM in DigitalOcean. Oh, look, that's the IP address I got. So let's let's do a who is on that, find their range, and I add the whole range for DigitalOcean. And, and so that's like, you know, it's an obscene number of IPs, like 16,000 IPs, but I still feel like that's a little bit more secure than leaving my Foreman and Puppet server open to the entire world. Um, it's, it's just slightly more secure, and it's probably just paranoia. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, actually, um, more or less using it the same way. Uh, if if you had maybe a few more informant servers, it would be useful, like to to manage Foreman with Foreman itself. So you could make right. Uh, so you could not only manage the the firewall, but also if you have a load balancer, uh, you could get. Uh, you could get your your foreman servers to register in a little balancer and so forth. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, there's there are two questions by foreman. <laughs> Actually, uh, who is foreman? I, I, oh, anyway, uh, one of uh, I, I I select them and they show up in the video. Uh, so first, let's go with this. Uh, which other plug plugins do you use? Is that in about here? Um, I have a lot of plugins turned on, but the ones that I mostly use are. Yeah, it's in both. Uh, I I have the Puppet DB one turned on, but it's not. I don't have Puppet DB installed yet, so <laughs> that's not quite there yet. Um, I use uh, EC2, which is in a is in a module technically, uh, and uh, uh, Rackspace and DigitalOcean are the three compute resources that I use. I set up the boot disk one because I wanted to try one of the things, one of the use cases that I have that isn't exactly handled by Foreman yet is that sometimes a customer creates a VM in their infrastructure. I don't have administrative access to the VMware infrastructure. All I have is the root password to the VM. And so what I've been doing is create it with bare metal and then copy and paste the finish script and just basically paste it into the server. Um, and that's been working other than the fact that I've had to sign the certs manually. Um, but that, that's the one use case that I was trying to work on this boot disk idea for. Um, and then there was the other thing, Discovery, that we that you guys were talking about yesterday or the day before, um, that I'd really like to figure out how to get that ready. But a lot of these things assume that you're administratively on the console. and this customer has already done a minimal install of CentOS 6 or 7, and I'm just logging in as root. So <clears throat> that's that's where I'm... Uh, the other place that that would work out really nice in is if the customer doesn't want to give me API access to their Amazon or their Rackspace or whatever. Same situation. Here's a VM. Log into it and make it make it yours, right? And so that that's kind of my situation. I've been using bare metal for that, um, but it would be nice if there was a way to say you know, give me the credentials to this machine, I'll log in and, and run the finish scripts for you. Just basically do the whole orchestration stuff from post-VM creation. Because it is nice to get all that, the IPA and the... Because the hoster created an IPA, which sets, you know, sets all that authentication up. It also sets up DNS if I have them on one of our domains, which is really nice, except on Amazon. We'll leave that one alone for a minute. Um, Amazon has that whole private IP thing going on. Uh, and then the other thing that is really nice about it is when I delete the VM, it cleans all that stuff up. So I'm, I'm really happy with I, I I've been really happy with Foreman. It's taken really nasty, nasty shell scripts that go out and create. It literally did all the stuff that Foreman does in a nasty shell script. And I'm very happy to make that go away. I mean, it's it was evil. It was hard to maintain. It was uh, how shall we yeah, say? Yeah, at that That's scale, I think. It, uh, uh, it, you know, it's it's been really nice since we've gotten this because we can create a VMware machine. I don't have any VMware instances set up on this one because it's in the cloud. 
But on our, our office instance, we do use VMware as well. Um, is okay. there... What, what's the next one? Uh, are you sharing the screen again? Uh, I, I so it's coming on and off. <laughs> is it, did it go away? I, uh, I'm, yes. I'm on my plug-in screen right now. Uh, right now, yeah, I don't see it. <laughs> okay, let me, I'll okay. see I'm sharing and reshare. It's not a big deal. Here we go. Okay. If that if that doesn't help it come back, that was just basically the. Uh, okay. Yeah. Now it's back. Okay. Sorry about that. That's Google Hangouts for you. Okay. So we have uh, so like I said, we have boot disk. I I have default host group, although I don't know if I've ever used it for anything. Um, I meant to. I don't know if I ever have. Uh, and then yeah. templates. I've you have some hooks uh, written, or you just install the plugin but never wrote any hook? I think that the intention for that was to be able to tie it into Spacewalk or something. Okay. Like that. But I haven't done anything with it yet. I, I, I'm definitely guilty of starting things and then not finishing them. <laughs> That's why I have the the Puppet DB module installed and the yeah, that kind of stuff without actually. Mm -hmm. I, I also see for my templates like this, you use community templates. Mm -hmm. So uh, for my setup uh, right now, you don't use it, I guess. But it's there. Uh, actually, we did create. It was on our uh, our mm -hmm. lab instance. We tried to create a remote Puppet server, and. Okay. Uh, we didn't do well with that. We ended up tying it back into the, the main Foreman server, and the, the problem we had was that it thought that all the Puppet servers were in sync, and mm -hmm. we needed to only have that customer's stuff on that Puppet server, and that wasn't how it was set up to work. So, uh, it, excuse me, it was just a use case issue, and quite frankly, we ran out of time to figure it out, so we just tied it back into the Foreman server directly. Okay. Uh, th there is another question I saw. Uh, it's did you use th sorry did you integrate Formum with any other tool besides DigitalOcean for reporting CLI API? Uh, I guess it doesn't refer to Hammer. I don't know if you use Hammer for the C for CLI. Hammer, yes. We we okay. run, we have definitely run Hammer. Uh, the main reason I use Hammer is mm -hmm. I was saying I extensively use host groups, so. I create a host group at the top level for the customer, then I create like Rails server, and then I create development. And it right now it uh, it just has parameters from the cut from the Rails server. I get Rails app as the role, and then I get app tier, which is poorly named, but you know that's common in the public world. And then to point out, I don't actually use the this part of the ENC. Um, I this this is effectively ENC here. This still creates that YAML. That comes out when they yeah. run, when it runs, and so this this along with my site.pp that says if there's a role, use it, is where I get my roles and profiles. They start coming in right there. Okay, uh, uh, but that's where I use my hammer. Is I I go through and create all these host groups in Hammer because they're all almost the same, <laughs> <laughs> and it's just it gets very redundant to go through and point and click and point and click and point and click when I can. You know there is a clone button in Informin as well. <laughs> is, but I had some issues, and I think I filed a bug on that, uh, with the parameters on the clone. It doesn't clone the parameters right or something. I, let me, I'll, I'll retract that statement. I think that there's an issue, but I haven't tested it in 1.8. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think I remember, I remember that being fixed, but even for 1.7, I'm, I'm, not in, I'm not right now completely sure. Anyway, uh, do you use uh, the API for anything? You have some shell scripts uh, I, that you want to share? Or? The only thing that I use is, is Hammer, and I just do a lot of up, 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 enter, up, 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 enter, control R, <laughs> bash. Um, I haven't yet written a script for it yet, but uh, that that's coming. I, it will be coming soon, but I'll, I'll probably just use Hammer because that's that's how I integrated with Spacewalk, too. I never used any of the API stuff. I just used... Uh, the, the command line of spacewalk, space command. Uh, okay. same, same idea as Hammer, really. It's just a command line that basically reaches in and does API commands. But do you use the console or or the CLI itself? Like, there's a Hammer console. I that... Both. I, I use the CLI itself when I'm uh, 
like the default command when I'm using it uh, to create the host groups. When I'm trying to figure something out, I'll go into the console because then I don't have to authenticate every three times. <laughs> okay. I'm just doing one. If I'm just doing one thing, I'll I'll tend to just use the command line. But okay, there are a few more questions still to be answered. Uh, uh, so one is which other tasks you need to do and you wish the foreman could cover. Uh. I, would I guess it's IT it. tasks. <laughs> right, right, right. I would love it if Foreman could run RTNK deploy uh, for the environment. That would be really neat. I know that that's not really, I mean, with Catello being integrated with Foreman, or I should say a module, uh, that would be a, something that I should work on, uh, or at least file an issue on if it's not there. Um, the other one is, <clears throat> and I think that it might already exist, because I think it's installed on our office one, but uh, just for our legacy customers, spacewalk integration, where it could uh, go in and it, I think it's mostly a cleanup thing, clean up the spacewalk host on delete, because they kind of create automatically when they we use uh, activation keys to register them. So um, they kind of create themselves automatically, but the cleanup on that, and like I said, I, I'm not entirely sure that that doesn't already exist. Um, I, I haven't actually logged into our office instance in probably two months. <laughs> so the good part is it just keeps right on working. Uh, cool. Uh, actually, actually, I'll have it say in there's a R10K plugin uh, recently developed from what I see because it's it's like the commits that I see on the repository he's um, he's posted on the format that. Or six days old. Uh, I'm gonna put it on on the link. Sorry, on the showcase. Uh, see, I see it in so there is that actually looks really good. Um, I'm looking forward to playing with that because that's doing so, that's actually doing another thing that I wasn't even gonna consider for for Foreman, which is cloning the environment and then editing the puppet file. The, that's basically what I do: is I clone the environment. Oh, and edit the puppet file, and then I edit the YAML files as well, but um, because I have my hybrid data also embedded inside my, I think I showed you guys that a second ago. Um, yeah. I have uh, I, my YAML embedded inside my uh, puppet environment. My It has puppet I, file, which creates modules, and then it has uh, hybrid data, which is awesome. I, I think, I really think that's the way to go, honestly. I see they also have uh, an R10K actions on Puppet environments. Uh, it says edit Puppet file. I don't know if, if there's a deploy uh, thing there, but it, it would be also it would be pretty good. Uh, I, I think I, honestly, I've I've been studying R10K like, and it seems to be like people normally run the repository. I'm sorry, I'm clicking around because I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, people normally run the repository for R10K on the Puppet server. So there's a notion of on commit actions. Um, our, <laughs> ours is actually in GitHub right now, um, which is probably not super safe. But since we don't put any passwords in there, it's not or anything that's not a development password in there, it's uh, it's not as bad for us. Um, we run. Uh, we we definitely can't do the on commit as easily with this. So we would have to run. We'd have to have a Jenkins server that could take you know the 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 ping from GitHub and then run the command and we've been I've been thinking about doing that but then along those same lines it's on GitHub I'm not entirely sure I want it to automatically deploy and commit <laughs> I want to know what's going in there so just in case I should ever get compromised on GitHub you know got it uh, cool uh, last question from what I see uh, maybe I'll ask you some more but uh, someone's wondering which area uh, needs improvements, uh, which areas like too complicated or not useful. So, so maybe tell us some things that you've never used at all from Foreman and you think that they're just not part of your use case or or maybe you can tell us some parts that you have uh, issues with. Perhaps the installer is, mm -hmm. is uh, overloaded for what it is. Oh, and, I or, oh. Awesome! I love the installer. Um, okay. I, I, would, I would like for the I would like for there to be an option with the installer to emit either a puppet module or something like that that would keep my 
that I could basically then apply to that server's environment to keep that server configured correctly. Um, you you I, mean configured as, as at, right at, after the installation, or right? Because I have been <clears throat> I've been very adamant about not touching my servers administratively, um, other than R10K, which now there might be a module for that. Um, there hasn't been any modifications to my servers post puppet inst post foreman installation, so I'd like to make the foreman installer my puppet environment, right? I'd like to make that how my system's configured. That might be a tall order. Uh, it, it's not something that you know everybody may want, so it's not really a very good idea, probably to spend time on. Something that I think really needs improvement is the process of creating a compute resource and then going and uh, applying images to that and then going back and ap applying templates to the images and then or to the OS levels there, there's just there's like a real like when you first set up Foreman there's like f several tasks that you have to do in a certain order and you have to keep going back and forth and back and forth and that that hurts a little bit difficult um, especially for like a new user like when I'm saying look how cool Foreman is and they're going uh huh. <laughs> so that yeah, it's complicated. That it would be neat if it could be. Oh God, I don't want to use the word, but use a wizard on it. Uh, uh, I, I was I was wondering if, if if we could maybe use a. So you're using community templates. Uh, if we could have something like community operating systems that are connected to these templates, and that way you skip. Uh, that part altogether, and if you have like the most popular OSs uh, connected to templates, that way you, you you should only just create the compute resource and create an image, and you just link the image with uh, whatever OS it is. If it if, if we have like a decent base of OSs slash templates covered in a community repository, I think that that could save. Uh, a lot of work. I don't know if, if if that's something that sounds like it would solve the problem, or you're thinking of something else, like a wizard, like you said. Well, that I think that that would help because then you wouldn't have to go through this. But for example, it's nine o'clock. Sorry, each time a new OS revision comes out, I have to go through and set these things. Each time I have to go in and check and check and templates. We do have. We did customize the finished script, by the way. Um, I, I would love to see one of the things that I did submit back was to change the root password on image creation so it Foreman has a notion of setting the root password but it only did that for certain types of hosts um, and I submitted the change back but then I found out that the templates only happen one time um, so if I look I'm gonna really quick pull up our thing here uh, the other thing that we need to do is set there's a fixed host in here that we need to fix that's something I need to submit back is right uh, here can uh, you uh, increase the font a bit uh, maybe, maybe I don't know if I can. I'll try right. it's control okay. plus yeah there we go I didn't know if it would work or not it's web based so that's something that uh, CentOS 7 at least burned me with is host name control <laughs> uh, and this one, this one might be a, a Amazon specific thing, but uh, you have to do preserve host name true, or it sets your host name back to their fancy IP dash number thing. Uh, and and that's me. I like host names. Oh, there is a full screen icon. <laughs> okay, I, you mean this one? Yeah, here we go. Hey, look at that. Cool. <laughs> a new feature. <laughs> so there we go. Uh, so I mean that that's the kind of thing that I don't know how we can do that because you don't definitely don't want to overwrite people's templates if they've customized them like I have. But we need to somehow get the ability to say, hey, uh, CentOS 7 just came out or RHEL 7, and you have to use this command now to set the host name. So this fixed host needs to be fixed by this, and I don't know how to get that in. Um, but yeah, like I said, that the whole process of associating templates to OSs, creating OSs, setting that back up with images, it would be really nice if there was some way to streamline that a little bit. That's my yeah. Point. It, it was also mentioned in the survey. Um, I don't know if you took part of, of, on it, but the community survey uh, 
that we did in January and February. Uh, there were a few people also mentioned that, and it comes up in the channel every now and then. Uh, I think there is no no one uh, working on it right now. I remember, I think Stephen Benjamin uh, did something like adding helpers in the templates and OS uh, views. Like when you when you don't have any template to associate it, it would guide you a bit through it. But still, if we could just skip that that step altogether, that would be that would be better. Uh, is, is there anything that you don't use at all other than LDAP authentication as you showed? I mean, sure. and, and LDAP, and not IPA, LDAP authentication. I showed the LDAP authentication was just to prove that I wasn't using it, to show that I was using yeah. LDAP. Um, <laughs> I added LDAP authentication because that's what I thought I was going to have to use. I just haven't removed it yet. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, there's, there's several modules that I don't use, several provisioning modules and things like that that I don't use. But that's not to say that I don't think that there's any piece of core foreman that I don't mm -hmm. use. Um, I, I okay. don't I, I don't use the puppet classes thing, but I that's a choice. I used to use it. As a matter of fact, if I go find one of my older hosts, I did select the role, but I because we're using roles and profiles, it was just one class that I was selecting, and I and then I was also setting a role that I'm using in uh, Hira data, so I figured right. out the point in having it in there twice, right? Yeah. Um, I don't use config groups, although I added it, and I think it might be useful. It's one of those started but not finished things. Um, I do use variables. Uh, one of the things that I ran into is that uh, IPA, I had to set uh, a variable for IPA. I think I did that in global parameters, actually. I lied. Yeah. So I had to set a parameter for I actually two for IPA, um, which thankfully the free IPA... Uh, template had the ability to set a variable, um, but that that way I could force that in there. And then here's where, if the customer had their own IPA server, I could override that at the customer level, and that would override the global parameter. But then I don't have to mess with it at every single customer by putting it in here. So I mean, th there's a lot of that in this one too. I love that one, by the way. <laughs> Enable Puppet Labs repo. Uh, there's just so many things that I when I try to do it in Foreman, I realize it's already been done. All I have to do is come set something like this, and it's mm -hmm. all for me. You know, I really love that. Do you use the uh, compute profiles? Uh, I haven't seen that. Which one? Uh, compute profiles. So compute research profiles. It's, uh, uh, it's like so uh, I, yeah, settings, I, predefined settings for uh, your VMs on compute resources. Right, so so I created one compute profile besides the ones that already existed. I created micro, which if you've used EC2, I'm sure you can I kind of deduce what that maps to. Um, but that's the only place I use the compute profiles is to, it, it basically is the default setting for a, uh, let me see here. What was one that I just recently set up? Let's, let's go with this one. Um, compute profiles in here. There you go. So that's basically, right, micro, small, medium, and large, right? That's what that. That's what I use them for. Um, I okay. don't know. That, that's to me, that, that's the only thing that you specify in here, right? Or is there more? <laughs> than that? Uh, well, uh, you're pretty much selecting oh, uh, all, 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 pretty much all the all the features that the computer research provide. Right. So, so I, it, it, if you could select, like, the zone, I think it is, on on a digital ocean droplet, it, it would allow you to to select that as well. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, and so, you, you, you oh, can I, set this yeah. at the host group level. So oh okay yeah. So I, I do use it. I, I haven't created several of them because at this point, um, I pretty much always use micro or small and CentOS latest. Um, and then I do set wherever the customer has their, because it's compute resource specific, uh, that I set this to be whatever the customer is using. In this case, they're using 2B. Uh, this is a bug, by the way. <laughs> I think that's already been filed, though. You have to switch this and then switch it back to get it to reload their security groups. Um, oh, is it? Oh. That, that's yeah, a actually bad. never noticed that. Uh, yeah, if it's not filed, please do it. It is. It is, because oh. I entered on it. Um, and then uh, there was one other thing. Oh, subnets is one thing that I don't use. Uh, and the reason is because that's mostly for bare metal provisioning. You, um, you, uh, 
I don't use uh, TFTP at all on the smart proxy then. No, because this system is out in the cloud, and mm -hmm. I don't get a TFTP level access to any of my VMs. They're, they come image provisioned. So I basically get a IP address, and as, as part of the compute resource, I either log in as CentOS or root or whatever, and a key, and sudo, and run the finished script. Well, I don't run it. Foreman does. But yeah, that's, I would say that's the one piece, and I would I would never recommend removing that because that's absolutely useful, and we do use it in our uh, VMware instance. But for mm -hmm. my production Foreman server, I don't I don't have any direct access to t to a you know hardware level. Okay. Okay. I, I guess you don't you also don't use uh, BNC or IPMI access on hosts. I know. Server. No, I don't. I don't actually have any bare metal host provision. <laughs> no, I get I get it. It's I mean, I, like I said, I use bare metal when I create hosts for VMs that are already created. <laughs> but, but it's just VMware. It's, it's for, yeah, it, it's for a VMware host. And okay. I have to be honest that the only thing, it requires a MAC address. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was just putting something bogus in there, but I got to the point where I was having trouble coming, like, one 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 two 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 two. <laughs> but I was like, oh, wait, I could just go actually put the real one in. It doesn't make any difference whatsoever, but uh, it is right. nice. We have used it before. Um, I just don't use it in production. Uh, it's just a lab thing for us. Um, uh, I saw Stephen Benjamin left a comment. He was saying that when you get Catello, it will do the template association dance for you and OS as it, it creates. So, <laughs> awesome. good thing. So yeah, yeah. I do uh, use this. I'll do PLA. Uh, I, I search. But most of my searches are actually, how shall we say, pre-provided because I'll click on, uh, in my email, I'll click on the little form and notification email and it will come up with a search that shows me that host and that report that mm -hmm. failed or whatever. Um, so that's most of the reason I use search. But I, I have searched for hosts in here before. I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why it's match PLA, but that's not the point. <laughs> you don't do, like, search on the API, perhaps, or um, let me think, or on fact values or fact names uh, or reports? Uh, are you just searching for hosts? I have never uh, tried that. Uh, OK. So uh, I, I'm asking because I know that that's kind of a bottleneck uh, in even small <laughs> systems. If you have like a lot of reports, it could be a bottleneck if you start to search for uh, fact values and stuff like that. Like it, it's really slow. No, not here. I mean in the in the slash facts um, URL. The dot size. Oh, okay, I've I've never tried that before. That's just uh, so you mean using slash. Fa I've never actually been to slash facts either. Or if it's not like that, it's slash fact underscore values. Um, anyway, I, I, yeah, maybe you can try it later. In, yeah, I've there. seen this interface. I, 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 when I was just poking around, I found this interface through here. But mm -hmm. um, I'm like, hey, I recognize that one. Uh, so I, I have seen it, but I've never actually used it before. Um, okay. It would be useful, though, if somebody, if I wanted to say, I need to find all, like I was trying to do a second ago, show me all the VMs that have a data disk, SDB. Right, um, right. So so the thing with it, with this is that, as you can see, you have almost 2,000 values mm -hmm. uh, with 18 hosts. I think that's what, what you said, 18 hosts? Yeah, I think so. Right, so it, it gets uh, really large really quickly, and, and it... I was just wondering if, if it would be a bottleneck for you, but uh, I would say that is that are those in the database or are those in like Solar or, or Elastic? No, no, they're they're in the database. We don't do uh, we don't have any other kind of search on Foreman Core. It's only uh, Elastic Search is only Catalog. Okay. Oh, okay. I I, <laughs> I heard. I was like, yeah, I remember installing Java on this. Uh, so <laughs> I would say that. They, if, if if it was if you installed Java with Foreman, then it would it was not our Foreman check the GPT. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I would say that it could potentially be useful um, as a reporting thing, but at this point in my uh, 
in my infrastructure, I haven't used it a lot. I do use the reports a lot, uh, but it's mostly like, hey, why did that fail, right? And so I, I use this interface more than the other one. Um, and this one here. Uh, that guy was a pain. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, I guess, I mean, we've already been here for more than one hour. Uh, yeah, we don't want to take up too much of your time. Uh, so how about we do one more question, and that's it. Uh, you you want to tell us like any feedback about um, about Foreman or about uh, the way we handle bugs, or the way we handle pull requests, packaging? Um, I've been really happy. I mean, uh, working from a development perspective, uh, working with the developers, Foreman has been one of the most fun projects I've worked on, uh, worked with, worked on. Uh, I formerly the the last time I've had that level of engagement was when I was working on OpenSSO and some stuff, some Sun other Sun specific things. Um, as far as being able to support the community, uh, I believe IRC is the primary means of support. Um, I wish that documentation was a little better. Um, I'm sure that everybody says that, and <laughs> I am I, and I am as guilty as everyone else about poor documentation. So I, I'm not definitely not you know putting you guys down here. Trust me on that. I know the documentation is hard to keep up, especially with a fast moving project. But there's a lot of times when I was like, oh, look, there's this option in the installer. I wonder what it does. And it's like you go and you search in the documentation. It says, well, you could turn it on or you can turn it off. And I'm like, yeah, but what does it do? How do I configure it? Uh, one, you know, There were a lot of things around the Puppet environments and things like that that I had trouble figuring out. Uh, but the beautiful thing about the Foreman installer is you can just keep running it. <laughs> so uh, especially for options like that that are literally just tweaking stuff in Puppet.conf. Uh, you, you know, I, I, I think that it's going to be really hard to document and say, hey, you know, a lot of these things are, or, or you know, hey, this is a legacy option. This was for Puppet prior to 3.7. Um, don't use this if you're not using Puppet, if you're unless you're using 3.6 or 3.5 or whatever, 3.4. I don't know what where the other versions were, but um, so I, you, you I, say we're, we're missing that, or I, I think that when I tried to do it, which admittedly was Foreman 1.6. The documentation around all, all those, you know, like just go edit the YAML file, right? Or go through go through the deep dark parts of the installer interactive. And there's a lot of that stuff that just doesn't have a lot of help about what it does or how what to put there. And one of the things I would really love to do with my Foreman server, and I did see finally I saw a support request about it, is I'd like to put a proper certificate on it. I don't know if you noticed, but I've got a little oh I've stopped sharing, but I have my HTTPS is hashed out. And it's because it's using its own self-signed cert, because it's using the same cert as the Puppet server. And I understand why we do that mm -hmm. by default. But it would be really nice if there was an easy way to, to just, as part of the installer, say, hey, where's your SSL cert at? I'll just use that. You know, for Foreman. I understand that Puppet needs to have a CA. It is a CA. But, uh, it, you know, there it, it is possible. I've seen a support request. I know at least a general idea of the steps to do. But that, to me, seems like, a real easy win. I want a proper SSL cert on my Foreman server. Uh, and then, of course, like I said, you don't users don't usually interact with the uh, with the proxy servers. But you have to. That that was where I ran into problems with my when I tried to change it was when it tried to interact with the pro smart proxies. I think. Okay, uh, I, I think for the SSL part, uh, what what you want to do is basically change the SSL certs that you have right now for your uh, some actual trusted SSL certificates on HTTPD, or if, if if that's all that you want to do, it's it's on it's on the installer right now. Uh, so I, I could actually look for the options. No, I I've seen there's a support request out there that has the steps identified, um, and so all I need to really do is go through it, but. That is uh, that. That's one of the things that I think would be. I I don't. I, I know I, I said SSL and easy in the same sentence, but uh, what I meant is, from a coding perspective, 
providing an option saying, would you like to provide an SSL cert or use the Puppet cert? And then oh, it, I see, I see. So, from an installer perspective, that might not be that hard. I don't know how you know how that would get in there, but uh, having the steps, it's kind of like I've been telling people that I work with is you can't automate something that you don't understand. So first, you have to understand how do you make Puppet work with uh, with a signed SSL cert from a CA and still able to communicate with Puppet. Okay, that's fixed. Now, how do you automate that, right? It's, there's, there's two steps there, and I think that we've got it figured out. I've got people hitting me on both sides here. But, yeah. Okay. Okay, so, cool. Uh, I actually note that down and see how can we ask for that better. Uh, it, it might be a bit, a bit complicated because you have to make sure also like if you set up SSL for your both for your foreman and the proxy, you have to make sure. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I said, I understand why it is the way it is because <laughs> it needs to be SSL and it needs to be all trusted. And I absolutely love that it sets it all up. I just <laughs> like it to say, "Hey, you have a cert for me? I could use that instead." <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. No, I know it's possible. I, I've read, I've seen the steps. I just haven't done it yet. So it's all good. I, I just. Yeah. Minor, yeah, minor. It, 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 it literally just changes uh, the Apache mod SSL uh, file settings. So, but, but yeah, it, it, if, if you change that, uh, I, I'm not sure of the implications on the proxy. Uh, possibly you would have to get also a suitable certificate from the proxy as well. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, my, my main thing would be just documentation so that if nobody's on IRC, mm -hmm. unfortunately, you guys have a different schedule than me. <laughs> you guys are at the end of your day. I'm at almost at the beginning of my day. So uh, yeah. it, it basically causes me to lose a lot of sleep if I want to get help from the best, from the real. Right. Even in the U.S., most of the team is actually in the East Coast in like around the East Coast from New York to North Carolina. Oh, so. and I had help from Michael and people like that, absolutely. Uh, and, and everybody's been really awesome in, in the support channel, or in the IRC channel. So anybody? Michael is actually from Germany. <laughs> he <laughs> is just around all the time. <laughs> okay, that's different. All right, so my, I mean, my main thing is if anybody, you know, is looking for how do I get help on this, IRC is really the primary channel right now. I. I, I guess that there may be a way to su submit support tickets if you're a, a RHEL customer, but for like the open source people like me, you're IRC and everybody in there is awesome. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, I, I've seen you around like yesterday helping on the format as well. Okay. Uh, uh, you're, you're both usually, but most people are actually only on, on the format. I, like, I think, mo I mean, most users not. Uh, users and developers. Right. Okay. And, and I definitely agree with keeping the conversation separate. I, I agree with two channels mm -hmm. because the conversations in the development channel could really confuse end users. <laughs> okay. So. so we can probably conclude it with what taken up like one hour and twenty minutes of your time today. Uh, hope you have something to show your coworkers today. I don't know. Do they know that you're doing this? Yeah. They're probably watching. Cool. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, okay. So, thank you. And uh, as soon as possible, we'll try to basically rewatch all this and uh, write a bit uh, on on your use case and write uh, how you use an R10K, DigitalOcean, and so forth, uh, IPA, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and write it write it up. Uh, Put it up in the in the foreman.org in a new section in the future. I'm not sure where it, where it fit where it fits right now. Uh, I'm doing a small redesign of the websites, and I have a special section for it. But anyway, it, it'll be there uh, sooner than later, and we we'll probably we probably will want to put it on on the blog as well. Uh, and that way, uh, hopefully, you guys can set up like an example for. Uh, future users. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, 
Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, we didn't take up too much of everybody else's time, too. I tend to ramble, so thanks, guys. <laughs> okay. Okay, see you, see you around IRC and the emails. All right, thanks. Okay, bye. bye.